Hello, Helia. Um, this is a talk about another. It was it was a new IPFS implementation in JavaScript, but like obviously, uh, since there's about a thousand new IPFS implementations being presented this week, it's now another new IPFS implementation in JavaScript. Uh, my name is Alex Potsidis. I am on the IP stewards team at Protocol Labs. Uh, I'm the maintainer of JSIPFS, JSLib2P, and a whole bunch of supporting libraries. So I'm sorry if I broke something. Um, so Helio, so what is it? It's a, it's a replacement for JSIPFS. Um, we're, trying to, we're trying to apply basically the last five years worth of learning to what an, an IPFS could be. Um, we want to make it smaller more lightweight, um, extensible, and more observable, and faster, and what hopefully, hopefully it's gonna make you more productive. But why? Why though? Why would you replace JSIPFS? Because it's obviously disruptive, because lots of people have written applications based on it. So there must be, there must be like a, a clear benefit to the users, otherwise we're just causing pain and, and refactoring for the sake of refactoring, which is, you know, all, can be quite a nice feeling. It's never a good feeling for the users. So what are the, what are the motivations for this? So from the start, JSIPFS uh, was supposed to be, uh, was supposed to be a clone of, of GoIPFS at the time and what is now Kubo, um, which means it had to copy the same API and implement the same features. Um, and there wasn't a, a whole lot of thought put into whether or not that was actually a good idea. It was just like, no, it must be the same. Um, which has led to some weird stuff. So like the Go IPFS, the Kubo API, um, like Kubo was primarily designed, it seems to be a command line tool, and the APIs reflect that. So the HTTP API is generated from the same, uh, like all the code is generated from the same source, and you end up with the same API, like you end up with a, what's well, an ergonomic uh, CLI API translated into a web API, which is a bit weird, which was then translated into a programmatic API, uh, which is kind of the primary use case for, for JS because we all use modules uh, and we write applications on things. We generally don't generally don't shell out to um, to CLIs. Um, so not a lot of the like not all the features make sense as well because it's very targeted at a server side environment. Definitely not the browser. So there's a lot of a lot of stuff that just doesn't really play to the strengths of JS. You end up with a, a lot of stuff bundled, um, which is you know generally quite a bad, a bad user experience for people who care about the time it takes for a website to render, which is definitely not a concern for a CLI. So it makes it big. It makes it really big. I was Googling pictures of the, well, Mr. Big, it didn't work out, but this Mr. Big, I mean, anyway, there's, there's, I guess you have to be quite old to remember this one. <laughs> It's not, I don't know if it's good or not. Anyway, so like when things are big, it's bad for the users um, because it becomes complicated to understand. It's bad for the maintainers because, because there's a lot of code to maintain. The API had a lot of duplication because uh, there's a lot of shortcuts to do certain commands and they all got, they all got replicated into the API, which is like not a, like not a good uh, design tenant for an API. Generally, you don't want to repeat yourself. And there's lots of wrapping of, of uh, other modules APIs which just increase the amount of maintenance, though it does shield you a little bit from breaking changes, so it's not all bad. But it meant that because the bundles are so big, you were getting code included whether you wanted it or not. Um, and then some, some progress was made towards splitting that out, uh, particularly around um, sort of more esoteric hashing algorithms and that kind of thing. But we kind of need to go a bit, a bit further. This is a slight tangent, um, but bad connectivity is definitely a problem with JS IPFS. Uh, when we had this all thing event last year, the number one thing people were complaining about was the fact that it's impossible almost to dial uh, server nodes from browsers. The, the USP of JS IPFS and now Helio is that it runs in the browser, but it's no use if you can't talk to the rest of the network. And we heard, we heard this loud and clear, and a whole bunch of, of work has been done on this. It's definitely the number one problem, but it's actually it's completely unrelated to JSIPFS. So you, some of you may have seen this diagram. This is a diagram, this, this table. This table is from the libp2p website. Um, it shows which transports are implemented where and by which, uh, which implementations. As you can see, 
the uh, bottom section is kind of the web-friendly ones. So you've got uh, WebSockets, WebTransport, WebRTC browser, uh, browser to server, WebRTC star, WebRTC direct. Loads of uh, the implementations do TCP. That's great. Browsers can't talk TCP. Um, they mostly all do WebSockets, but the problem with WebSockets is that you need to configure a certificate, and that just appears to be a massive stumbling block. Uh, no one can configure an SSL certificate, which is, you know, this is the web track. We are all web people. Like, configuring SSL certificates is our bread and butter. It's super easy, but it still manages to be this, this tiny stumbling block that trips everyone up. So it's lovely that it's there, but it's not, in, in, in the real world, when you try to connect to nodes on the network, it's just not, it's not a thing. It might as well not be there, if I'm honest. Um, so then what does that mean? That means that these, these server-side implementations go primarily, but also Rust as well. They don't really cater for browser nodes at all, which is why it's so hard to dial anything. And like no, no new JS implementation is going to change that, unfortunately. Um, but that is changing. So there's this new transport called Web Transport, which is super exciting, which lets us dial server nodes from the browser without a certificate. There, there is a certificate, but uh, the protocol allows you to use self-signed certificates and then does a tiny bit of the noise handshake to then do noise encryption on top of that. Oh, no, sorry, it doesn't do it on top of it. it we validate that the remote peer is the peer we think we're talking to, and then it uses the built-in encryption in the transport itself. Suddenly, that tiny, tiny stumbling block is no longer there. So we can now have browser nodes dial server nodes directly, which is, is going to be a complete game changer, I think, for, for JS IPFS or IPFS in JS in the browser. I think this is, this is amazing. If you're running Chrome, because it doesn't work anywhere else, that is, the, that is the, the slight downside. But you can run it in web workers and you can run it in service workers. So you don't need to worry about upsetting the UI thread or anything like that. It's fantastic. It's really good. Very excited. The other, the other new transport that's arriving is WebRTC. We had WebRTC, Alex, I've seen it. It's on the repo. It was on that diagram you just showed. Yes, I know, but this is the new one, the new, new one, the new WebRTC. <laughs> so the old one had a, dependent, a hard dependency on a signaling server. So with WebRTC, the first thing that the two clients need to do is negotiate how they're going to connect to each other. And this is called the SDP handshake. Now, the old version had a WebSocket server that you had to run. Like, we ran a few, but they always fell over and that kind of thing. Like, you had to run it, and it made this hard dependency on, on this, this, this other server to, like, communicate with to do the SDP handshake, and then you can connect, which is great. Uh, the implementation wasn't perfect. It did do uh, full noise encryption on top of that, so you were double encrypting everything. Um, it, WebRTC also has its own stream muxing capability that we completely ignored and did stream muxing on top of the double encryption on the single data channel. That has all changed. The new version uses WebRTC's um, encryption. It uses WebRTC's stream muxing. It's great. Uh, it's really great, unless you're in a web worker or a service worker where it doesn't work, because WebRTC is only available on the main thread. So we've made significant progress, um, but there are some caveats. You should, incidentally, stick around for the universal connectivity demo that happens right after. I'm doing this talk, and I'm doing the next talk as well, and then it happens after that one. Uh, they, it's going to be amazing. They're going to show connecting from like all the different implementations to all the different implementations, and how they all work together, and basically how we now leverage WebRTC and Web Transport and all that kind of stuff to, to actually really, really get JS going in IP, IPFS in JS going in the browser. It's going to be. It's going to be like. I'm super excited about the future for this. Enough lib P2P. It's a lot of lib P2P chat. Okay, so what is Helio? Helio is a very simple API. Uh, we definitely want it to be as minimal as possible uh, so that people can build abstractions on top of it rather than it trying to do everything for everyone. So I'm going to go through each one. Uh, but yeah, so you basically got, you got a block store where the blocks live. You've got a data store where the data lives. You've got some pinning and some garbage collection and then lib P2P for all the networking layer. So what's a block store? It is, hopefully, like it sounds, it's a store that you can put blocks into, and you put them in with a CID, and then you can give it a CID later, and then you get a block out. If the block is not there, it is routed with BitSwap, so BitSwap will kick in and try and fetch from the network. You receive a promise of a block, which will then resolve 
uh, unless you abort it, obviously, um, and you have your block. Other data transfer methods may be available. So at the moment, at the moment, Helio just bundles uh, bit swap. But I would like to look into how we can not do that and just uh, have it uh, have it able for you know have, make the user able to put their own data transfer protocols into it as well, so that we can then experiment with with new fun things and and not have to again like bundle code that isn't being used. But for the moment, uh, BitSwap is 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 what it has. The data store. What's a data store? It's basically a data, like a key-value database. Uh, there are implementations for IDB, for level, uh, or if, even a file system, if you want to put the files in the database and the database in the files. I don't know. Uh, you can do it if you want. It's very simple. Um, and it's used by internal uh, components like the DHT and IPNS name resolution service. What else? So pinning. Like, pinning is really important because you don't want to have you know, unbounded storage. So you need some way of saying, well, these blocks are important and these ones aren't. Uh, so you have to pin blocks, uh, pin DAGs, and they're in the, in the process of pinning it, you will walk the DAG and make sure that all the blocks are present, um, which is obviously important. But garbage collection is a thing. Uh, so you do actually need to be able to delete those, the, the unpinned blocks quickly. And this has been a significant challenge in the past for both JS and for Go. And then underneath all that, there's libp2p, um, which I'm going to, just going to skim over. It basically provides a networking layer, so peer discovery, data transports, uh, etc. That's it. That's all. That's all Helio is. Box store, data store, pinning, garbage collection, libp2p. There's no file system in Helio, so maybe I don't know. In the planetary file, well, it's, so IPFS, as we've seen from the the new website, is uh, content addressing and transports. Um, so it's definitely an IPFS, but there's no file system bundled with Helio. All, all of that will be provided by other modules that you will then compose with the Helio node that you've just configured. Enough talk, Alex. This is really boring. A demo. So, so, so the first demo that we have is just putting and getting a block. So the first thing that I do is I create a Helio node. Uh, I create a block. So just text encoder, turn the hello world string into a UNA array, uh, hash it, SHA256, great. Create a V1 CID, put it in the block store, get it from the block store. And then just print it out, nice and easy. So if I run node demo one, amazing, it totally works. God. <laughs> Tough crowd, really. Oh, crikey. All right, another demo. That's boring. Uh, so what else? So obviously the networking thing is super important. So here we're doing a little bit more in our creation. So we create a data store and a block store. So this is just using in memory uh, data stores and block stores. We create a Helio node. So we pass the data store and the block store in. Um, but we actually want to pass the data store into the P2P, so it doesn't use its own. I mean, it could. That's fine too. Uh, right, for our purposes anyway. So what is it doing? So we create a lib P2P node. We listen on a WebSocket socket. Uh, configure the WebSocket transport. Noise, Yamux. Pass the data store in. We're going to create two of them. We're going to get one to dial the other. And then same, same. So we create a block. We put the block into one, and then we pull it from the other. And then we stop the notes. It's exactly the same. <laughs> Consistency is key. I should have asked. Can you see that? Is that big enough? I can, I can make it bigger. It looks bigger on my screen, but then I'm closer to my screen. So that explains a lot. OK, great demos. Right, file systems. Because that's what we're here for. This is IPFS after all. So in the beginning, there was a UNIXFS. Then there was a UNIXFS 1.5. I mean, sort of. Is, I don't, has it landed in Kubo yet? I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't checked the issue for a while. I don't think it has. Um, UNIXFS v2? Is that a thing? Is that a thing? No, don't ask. I don't, I don't, don't want to talk about it. 
Um, anyway, so what happens after that? I mean, why, why would we couple ourselves to this? Um, so let's not, let's just not do it. Let's just try and support anything and let people, let people experiment. So there's no blessed file system in, in Helia um, because I would like to see things like WinFS being treated as equally as UnixFS. Um, because it's all down to the application, and that gives the users the choice of, of to, to use the file system that works the best for them. Um, all that matters is as long as it talks blocks, because Helio presents a, a networked block store. So as long as you can put blocks and get blocks, go nuts. So a quick demo. So here we have very similar to before. I've moved the create node function into its own file so that we're just not distracted by the noise. Uh, and so here we have a UnixFS implementation using Helia. So we create the two nodes again, get them to dial each other, create, create a, uh, a UNA array from a string, create our file system. So you'll see, so we have a Helia node and we're passing it into UnixFS and so we have a file system. And so we call add bytes, we add the bytes, we get a CID back. We're going to create a directory. So you'll notice here that we're not really we're not, um, we're not importing an enormous tree. We're just doing a single chunk of bytes, and then we're going to what we're going to do is we're going to put it into a directory. So first of all, we need a directory to put it in. So we just add a directory. We get an empty an empty directory CID, and then we can use the copy command to copy the file that we added into the directory and give it the name file.txt. And so then we're just going to print the CIDs out. And then that's it. Then we switch to the other node. We create another UnixFS, pass node B in, and we just list the, uh, the CID directory, which has been put into node A, and then stop the nodes. Da, da, da. So there you go. So we've created a CID, created an empty, CID, an empty directory, and then we have put the CID into the empty directory. And then on the other one, we've listed it, where we print out the name and the CID of the directory content. So we see file.txt and then the CID. That's it. That's UnixFS. <laughs> and the important thing is, is, of course, it could be, it could be anything. It could be any file system. Okay, observability. We have logging. Like one of the one of the one of the things that happens a lot with RPFS implementations in general is there's a lot of moving parts. It's very hard to work out what's going on. Um, logging is is definitely your friend in this. It's very easy to enable uh, environmental variables or local storage in the browser, and you get this incredibly readable display. I mean, I, you can all make that out, right? You know exactly what's going on. There's a bug in there somewhere. <laughs> no, it's awful. I mean. <laughs> Not, not a great user experience. So what I'm trying to do with Helia is introduce this idea of progress events for everything. So we have progress events for things like uh, for adding files and exporting files at the moment, but it, it needs to go deeper and be able to, like you should be able to, like it's, it's an important uh, bit of context that's carried throughout the application, like the execution stack of a given operation. And then so these progress, progress events can tell you what's happening, where things are stalling, um, and so where you need to look to see why things aren't working. Demo. I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say no, not a demo, because like, this, I'm just gonna go on a little tangent. So we talk about SIDs quite a lot, and I can't call them SIDs. Like, ah, oh, I, I have to call them CIDs, because, you know, um, like when people talk about SIDs, maybe they think of this guy from Ice Age. Or maybe, maybe this guy from Toy Story. Or maybe this guy, if you remember my talk on debugging things from IPFS camp, Sid Vicious. No, not this Sid Vicious, this Sid Vicious. This is the original Sid Vicious. Incidentally, this picture is in the National Portrait Gallery in London. So this is art, actually art. But no, I don't think of, I don't think of Sid Vicious. I think of this guy. This, is, this, guy, is a guy, this is a guy called Sid James. He's, um, he's a comedian. Uh, He's from South Africa, but he's, he was on TV a lot, like in a lot of movies uh, in the UK. Uh, he died on stage, incidentally, um, which is terrible for a comedian, I guess. 
Like he's not, it's not, he's not the most famous comedian to have died on stage as this guy, Tommy Cooper, um, who actually died on TV. He was on stage, but on TV, which is immeasurably worse. Anyway, Sid James, uh, he was in the Carry On movies, and whenever anyone says Sid, I think of, I think of this. Anyway, sorry about that. So back to the, um, back to the demo. So progress events. So this one's a little more in depth because we're going to use IPNS for this one. So we have a UnixFS and we have an IPNS, uh, which is important in the same way as UnixFS. We have DHT routing uh, for IPNS. So one of the things that is really hard to to work out what's going on with a lot of the time with JSIFS is that so much is bundled by default. Um, it's not always clear like what's going on and and where things are going wrong. So with Healy, you very much have, you um, you very much are explicit about the things you want to enable. So IPNS has a DHT routing and it has a pub sub routing, and the pub sub routing is great unless it isn't. Um, and it's really hard to work out which is the one that's gone wrong. So if you want, so, so if, you, if you're trying to debug things, now we can just say right, well disable this, like explicitly enable DHT, explicitly enable pub sub. Uh, and you can see which one works and which one doesn't. Anyway, so in the demo, I've got three nodes. One, we're going to publish a record on one. One, record, one uh, node is going to host that record, and then another node is going to resolve it. So we create the three nodes, and then we, get, we connect them in a row. So the publisher dials the uh, host, the record host, and the record host dials the resolver, so they're connected in a line. I've got no peer discovery going on, so the publisher will not uh, contact the resolver. We add a file, same as before. We create an IPNS uh, with the first Helia node. Um, we pass in the DHT, and we create a, a, a key. So we're going to we create a peer ID that we use to pub, as, uh, sorry, to publish the IPNS name. Now, there's a little bit of sleight of hand here, because I mean, we all know how IPNS works, right? I'm going to, I mean, I have to look it up sometimes. So what happens is you have a peer ID and you use that as the, uh, as the IPNS name. And when someone wants to resolve that, peer, that, that IPNS name, they look at the peer ID, they find the nodes on the network that are close to that peer ID, CAD close, uh, with the DHT resolver, and they say, do you have the record for this, like the most up-to-date record for this IPNS name? You get a whole bunch of them back, you compare them, and you choose the most up-to-date ones. So that means that you have to be able to predict where the record for the demo to work, you have to be able to predict where the, uh, where the record is going to be stored. So this create peer ID function, all it does is it, it generates a peer ID that is closest to node B, who, if you remember, is the, is the record host. So we can guarantee that the record will be hosted by by the intermediate node that's sitting in the middle of, of A and C. So we import the key chain, we import the, uh, the peer ID into the key chain of node A, and we use the key to, to publish uh, our IPNS entry. And then on node C, we create a UnixFS, we create an IPNS with a DHT uh, resolver, and we just resolve it. Um, I'm just going to comment that out for the time being. and. Uh, there we go. So, and then yes, and then we, we just, we cap the bytes from that CID and then we, we print them all to the terminal. So, if I do node demo for, da, da, da. hello world, look, it totally works. But don't take my word for it because we're interested in the, the progress events, aren't we? So we can see, if I comment that back in, when I actually do the resolve, so this, this horrendous mass is the actual IPNS entry. Dun, dun, dun. So we scroll down and suddenly we see lots of uh, events happening. So the first thing that we do is we try to get the uh, record from the local data store. It's not found. So then we have to go to the routing. So we make a DHT query. This is the peer that's responded and here's the value which is the IPNS record, which we can then resolve to a CID and then pull it down. <laughs> but wait, there's more. Because we, the, we can put the in progress events in the actual uh, resolve as well. 
sorry, in the, when, we're, when we're catting the CID as well. So I'm going to run it again. Make it a bit bigger. And now we see, we see the DHT query come back. And now we're resolving the CID. So we've gone to bit swap. We've done a find providers of the CID. We've dialed some peers to do the file providers. We've sent them the what list. Send them the, and in comes the block. We put the block locally. And then here we have the actual export. Progress events. <laughs> Amazing. So all these come in in real time as well. So I'm looking forward to seeing some wonderful visualizations of the internals of, of IPFS nodes. Um, all this stuff like, will eventually be supported remotely as well uh, via RPC. It's going to be it's going to be great. I'm very excited. Thank you for sitting through that demo. That was very long. Whew. Okay. The big questions: Is it ready? Is it ready? Can I use it? I mean, what hopes, right? That was great, right? Yeah. yeah, I hope so. I really hope so. I mean, Helio One V One has been released. So yes. <laughs> Not only that, Unix of SV1 has been released. <laughs> IP and SV1 has been released. <laughs> this is incredible. So yes, you can totally, you can totally use it. Like, I mean, V1, what does it even mean? All that means is V2 is coming soon, right? <laughs> really, but I mean, yes, V1, it's here. It's here. You can totally use it. So how can you get involved? Port your apps. So there's no, there are no features in JSRPFS now that aren't available in Helia, I believe. Um, examples. So we have an examples repo. Uh, like Russell has been helping out loads, porting examples. There's a whole slew more of them. If you check the Helia repo, there's, a, there's a, like a hit list of the most important ones. Um, yeah, please do come and, 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 and help and talk to me. So I'm here. here at, I'm here all week. Try the fish. The fish was last night was great. Um, anyway, like this is Tommy Cooper again. Never mind. Uh, yeah, come and find me. Uh, come and tell me like your use cases, like what you're excited about. What are the problems? Like, what are the problems that you have with the existing implementations? And, and we'll fix it all. It's going to be amazing. So uh, at the last all thing, uh, Juan stood on the stage and talked about a Cambrian, a pre-Cambrian explosion of IPFS implementations. I want to see a pre-Cambrian explosion of apps of browser apps written on JS IPFS and or IPFS in JS in the browser and Helia, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to be amazing. I'm super excited. That's it. That's me. That's the end. Any Are there any questions? Go. Uh, I was Yeah, th th thanks, Alex. Uh, I was just curious, can someone use Helia in the browser? Yes. Any gotchas or anything that they need to be aware of? No. All right. <laughs> Zero defects. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, you go to the, uh, if you go to the examples repo, there are examples on how to bundle Helia with Webpack and ES Build. Um, and there will be X and there's, there's Next.js as well, I think we have now. Um, and there will be more added for more specific browser technologies. But, but yes, absolutely. Hi, uh, I have a question. I saw during the, in one of the examples, you casually just threw a DHT in there. I did. Is there DHT support? Yeah, of course there is. You saw it with your own eyes. <laughs> <laughs> can I use Helia in Electron? Yes, you can. There's a demo in, uh, there's an example uh, and running it in Electron. So of course Electron doesn't support, like, Helia is ESM only, and Electron doesn't support ESM. Uh, as the entry JS, but you can load it using the import, the dynamic import function. Um, so yes, with that caveat. Thank you. Any other questions for Alex? Oh, okay. Thanks, Molly. I'm just curious, what's coming next, Alex? What What do you hope to do it's in the next finished. three months? It's finished. We won. <laughs> There's nothing coming next. So what I'm hoping comes next is. Um, is things like extra file systems. And so building on top of the primitives that Helia presents. So doing things like, like I would love to see WinFS. So again, I'd love to see WinFS running on top of Helia. Um, I believe there's a, there's a TypeScript implementation of it, all the Rust one and Wasm, anything that spits out blocks. Um, that's what I want to see, people experimenting.
I'm curious if you know of any examples of, I know it's just hitting V1, but of things that people are, are building or that you would like to see people building um, using Helia. Um, what are some examples or some use cases that you think are really exciting or that you know people might already be working on? Um, that's a good question because it is, it is box fresh. Um, I mean, so I'm, I'm really keen to get it. I'd, I'd love to run uh, like a bootstrapper node on it. That would be really nice. Properly um, uh, battle test it. Um, like people who are running, well, so, um, yeah, so there's like the service worker example that um, Russell's put together. So that's running basically like a gateway in your browser, which is all built on top of Helia. Um, just anywhere, anywhere you would have used JSIPFS, you should be able to, to replace it with, with Helia. Are there any plans to take things like IPFS Share, I think was the website, or there's the, the one that Jim Pick worked on back in the day mm -hmm. with PeerPad. Take any of those like more meaty browser to browser applications and oh, yeah. get them using Helia? Definitely, because also um, the, like, the latest versions of libp 2 p uh, will not be backported to JSIPFS. It's purely a factor of the development hours that are available. Um, so anything moving forward would would look to use Helia. And then, because then you get all the new, the nice new transports um, so available with lib P2P, so WebRTC, Web Transport, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, definitely. No more star, star signaling craziness. No more great. star, star signaling. And so just to be clear, Alex, what's the future for JSI PFS? Um, so the repo well, I mean, so if there are any emergency security fixes, I guess we will try to port those back. Um, but the, the repo itself will not have any further development done on it um, because we have uh, the, the equivalent functionality in Helia. So.